Um, I'm Hillary. Okay, so I just want to start today with a little exercise because everyone's excited to participate this morning at 9.55 a.m. Um, raise your hand if you've ever worked with someone who we could classify as a know-it-all. Okay, awesome. Well, keep your hands up. Sorry. Now keep your hand up if you enjoyed working with that person. Yes. Okay, so most of us do not enjoy working with a know-it-all. I've, I've met some very kind, sweet ones in my time, especially in this field. But now raise your hand if you've ever felt pressure at work to pretend you know something, know all the things, or obfuscate the fact that you didn't know something. Yeah. Okay, so let the record show that's basically everyone in the room. And my point is to illustrate that there's a tension there, right? No one wants to work with a know-it-all. We want to be vulnerable, good teammates who are trusting of each other. And we feel this intense pressure to pretend we know everything. So what I want to do today is talk about some ways that we can shift our team culture in order to make that less of a problem and instead embrace the fact that the best time to start learning something is the moment you acknowledge that you don't know it. And that's what makes us excellent learners and excellent engineers. So, if you take nothing from this talk today, I hope you take this. So like take a picture with your phone, say it to your partner next to you, but I don't know is a superpower. Right? And what I mean by that is that the moment that we say, I don't know, I don't know where the code is for that. I don't know anything about this technology. I don't know what the heck you're talking about. Those are all, that's the moment that we're signaling to our teams and to ourselves that we are ready to learn something. And it's the moment that we're showing ourselves and our teams that we feel safe being vulnerable with them and that we are excited to collaborate with them. So if, again, if you take nothing else from this, I hope that you say these words a little bit more after this talk than you were before. So what I want to talk about today is three concrete steps toward learning out loud on our teams. And I just, and this is, this talk is oriented toward increasing the frequency with which everyone on the team is able to say, I don't know, let's learn it together. And I want to say that it is sort of geared toward folks who are leaders on their teams, but I don't necessarily mean a people manager, although that absolutely is a person who can, who can implement these changes. It could mean someone who's a very senior IC. It could mean a pretty junior IC, but the person who has the most tenure on the team or at the company, right? There's lots of ways that we can be a knowledge leader and an engineering leader on our team. So the three steps here that we're going to talk about are defaulting to not knowing, championing public problem solving, and formalizing spontaneous learning. So these are three concrete things that you can go do on your team in order to start building this culture of I don't know as a positive statement. So the cultural goal with defaulting to not knowing is we want folks on our teams to say to themselves, our team values learning and experimentation, and our team is a safe space to acknowledge gaps in our skills. So when I talk about defaulting to not knowing, obviously I mean saying the phrase I don't know over and over again and out loud and very much in public. But I also, there are also ways that we can default to not knowing when we do know the answer, right? So let's say that you have a colleague or a friend or an employee who comes to you and slacks you this line of code and goes, I don't know what's going on with this line of code. It keeps throwing this error. Do you know what's going on here? And let's say you do know. Right? Let's say it's like a glaring typo, and you're like, this is the simplest thing in the world. You're missing a semicolon. Right? And you are going to have a lot of urges in that moment. One of the urges you're going to have is going to be just tell them you're missing a semicolon. One of the urges is going to be think to yourself, why did we even hire a developer who can't see that he's missing a semicolon here? One of your urges is going to be to make this person feel really silly or to ignore the request altogether. And you are going to quash those urges and you're going to engage with him from a place of not knowing, right? You don't know what he's already tried. You don't know if this is his language of choice. You don't know what his area of expertise is, right? So what you're going to do is you're going to start asking him questions because you are going to create a space where you both don't know something. And that's going to make everyone in the interaction feel a lot more safe being vulnerable about the fact that they're, they don't know something or they don't have a particular skill. The other thing about defaulting to not knowing is remembering that seniority does not equal correctness. Right? Seniority does not equal correctness. It doesn't equal competence. What it means is that you have more years doing something than someone else, but it might not be the thing that they're having a problem with. I am 
a fairly expert person at CICD. I also work at a company where most of our code base is C++, and I don't know a I don't know a single line of C++, right? That doesn't mean that I'm not a very senior engineer, and it doesn't mean that I'm not an expert in my own thing, but I can, I can interact with my team understanding what it feels like to be someone who doesn't know something, because I don't know things all the time at work, right? The other thing you can do, so let's say you don't know the answer. Let's say you don't know why that line of code is erroring. You can say, I don't know. Let's figure it out together. And then when you go to figure it out together, what you can do is you can say, let's read the documentation together. Right? I think that as leaders, people who are super busy, we're concerned about our velocity, we have a whole bunch of things to get done, right? It's really tempting to just like Google it and send the doc and be like, hey, go read the docs. If you have time, and my argument is that you should make time because it means that everyone gets more time at the end of the day, right? Don't just send them the docs. Say, hey, do you want to like get on a screen share really quick and read these docs together? Right? So don't just send the documentation, answer with documentation. Right? Keep it as a dialogue, but bring the documentation into the dialogue also. You can also, if you really don't have time to help this person, or if you're not the best person for it, like if you're asking me a C++ question, I'm not going to know the answer. Right? You can redirect the teaching to public spaces. So, and this, this sort of brings me into the next step, but you can basically say, hey, I don't know the answer to this, or I'm really, really busy right now, I don't have time to look at it, but why don't you go ask Tina? She knows C++. And you can ask her in the general questions channel, right? So what you can do is you can redirect that to the more appropriate place to ask, and also make sure that you're redirecting to a public space. Because what we want to do is we want to bring these moments of not knowing into the light. We want to make sure that it's safe to not know things. We want to make sure that we're celebrating someone acknowledging that they didn't know something. So that's a nice segue into championing public problem solving. And before we start into this, I just want to quickly note that if you've ever been to any kind of management training, you have definitely heard the phrase, praise in public, criticize in private, right? And that's a really awesome rule, and you should definitely do that. And, but I also want to say that when someone's asking a question or they don't know something, it can feel a little bit like a gray area because you don't want to out someone if they were trying to hide that they didn't know something, but you also want to be encouraging this culture of I don't know as a superpower, right? This culture of learning out loud. So I just want to make a note here that like, you know, use your judgment, but if you're going to redirect a question or a, a gap into a public space, make sure that you get that person's consent and or make sure that you do it in a way that's really gentle and affirming and isn't like, hey, so-and-so doesn't know this, but say like, hey, like we were working on this together and we couldn't figure out the answer and you know, like make sure that it's a shared collaborative not knowing instead of just like saying like, hey, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Um, okay, so the cultural goal here is we want people to feel that on our team we are collaborative problem solvers, we value creative solutions, and our team has useful documentation and we don't unnecessarily repeat work. This is a complaint that engineers have all the time, correctly. It's like, I've fixed this bug so many times and no one can remember how to fix it, and I just don't know what's going on here. If you do this troubleshooting in a public channel that has some kind of record, you suddenly have documentation about how to fix that bug. So like, I don't know who needs to hear this, but you can link Slack threads in Jira tickets, guys. Or, or in documentation, right? <laughs> it's, it's one of the wonderful things about our interconnected world. So when we're championing public problem solving, one of the things that we need to do is actually create a formal space for it. So I've had an experience that I'm sure a lot of people have had where I've gone to a new job and I've been sitting there on my first day and someone's been like, hey, if you have questions about the infrastructure, post in the infra channel. And if you have questions about CICD, post in the CICD channel. And if you have questions about the office, post in the you know, San Francisco office channel. And then I'm like, yeah, but okay, what if I have a question about like where to find where this secret is defined, and I don't know which team owns it, and I just saw it in the AWS console and I don't even know what it is. It's like, well, one of the things about questions and about not knowing something is you often don't have the right words to ask. You don't know who to ask, because if you truly don't know it, you don't even have a foundation to start from to formalize the question. So like, make a Slack channel called No Stupid Questions, right? Make a JIRA ticket type called general questions. Designate someone on the team who's the, this is the person who you ask who to ask if you don't know who to ask about something. Because one of the things that's really hard when you're first learning something, whether it's because you're new and you're first learning the team and the job, or because you are learning a new technology, is that it can feel like you don't know enough to even know where to start. 
So if you give someone a place to start that's like the formal place for asking the question, that gives them a really good starting point and it signals to everyone that you value learning on the team. You also want to resist the urge to fix. So it's really tempting when you are technically proficient at something, someone comes and asks you about it, to just be like, oh yeah, here's a code snippet, that'll fix your problem. Like we've all done that, I've done that. It's often the most expedient way to get a problem fixed, especially if, you know, if you're like an expert at something. But you really want to resist this urge because that is going to reify for this person. Some people on this team know some things and some people don't and I'm in the group who doesn't know things. Right? And that's like a really bad place to be if you are trying to be a learning-oriented person. And it's definitely bad for the culture if you're trying to build a learning-oriented culture, right? So instead of fixing the problem, do any of the things that we talked about in the previous slide, right? Let's look at the documentation together. I think Tina knows the, how to fix that problem. Let's ask her. You know, let's get into it. If we're in a physical office, let's get into a room and like get this on a whiteboard and see if we can figure it out from first principles. Right, but, but resisting the urge to just do the quick fix for someone because they're not going to learn anything and they're just going to leave with a bad taste in their mouth and or they're going to leave just thinking like, great, I don't ever have to learn that because, you know, Hillary knows that. Documenting decision making is also really important, right? We were talking about documentation earlier. Make sure that if you make a decision about how something works or how to do something in like a private, in like a verbal conversation, that you write down not just what you guys decided, but how you got there. This is really hard to remember, especially when we're in a high velocity environment, right? But let's say that we're trying to decide if we want to do canary deployments or blue green deployments, and we just feel like, and, and we're, we're talking, we're talking, and one of us says like, you know, I just feel like we don't have the user volume to make canary deployments reasonable, right? We just, we can't split off a part of our user base and have it be a meaningful pool of people. So we're gonna do blue-green deployments. It's great that you made a decision and it's awesome that you're now gonna go write your very detailed documentation about how you're gonna implement the blue-green deployment, but just do me a favor and put a sentence up there that says like, per an offline conversation with so-and-so, we decided not to do canary deployments for this reason because your team's gonna turn over, people are gonna forget, someone's gonna come along and be like, why don't we do a canary deployment? And everyone's gonna go like, I don't know, I can't help you. We don't remember that, because why would we remember that? We're doing a whole bunch of stuff every day, right? And then the other thing I wanna really make sure that we do is thank team members for struggling publicly. And this one can be really hard to remember in the moment, and it also can be kind of awkward. So a couple of phrases that you can use if you wanna thank a team member for struggling publicly is, Thank you so much for bringing that problem to the team. I feel like we all really learned something from it, right? Or you can say, I really enjoyed working on this problem with you. Or, you know, if you are a manager and you, and you do have like a relationship where you can give more formal feedback, you can, you can say like, great job fixing the problem, but also like, great job taking a collaborative approach to fixing that problem. Right, because again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to make people feel safe. We're trying to make people feel like they can acknowledge that they don't know something. And we're trying to build this culture where everyone on the team feels that way, even the folks who maybe are a little bit more prone to feeling unsafe, like those who are really shy. Right? One of the things we often see in teams is there are some people who are really quiet and some people who are really loud. And what we want to do is make sure that the people who are speaking up more often are doing it in a way that makes other people on the team feel safe to speak up. And one of the ways you can do that is in a very public setting, say like, hey, Joe, I really loved the collaborative way you approached solving that problem. You know, it's not, it doesn't mean that tomorrow your quiet teammate is gonna speak up, but it does mean that they're gonna clock like, hey, this person who I look up to, this leader on this team, right, she really loves it when people take a collaborative approach to solving problems, and they're gonna remember that. So finally, I want to talk about formalizing spontaneous learning. Um, I didn't really intend for these to be in a particular order. I do think that this third bullet point is easier to accomplish if you've worked on the other two. So just bear that in mind. Um, the goal here is that on our team, we don't have to choose between productivity and professional development, and our leadership values are individual growth. Right, so once you have people in the habit of doing this learning out loud, of saying I don't know, of having a growth mindset about things they haven't learned yet, right, once you have this culture going, you want to formalize it and codify it. 
right? Because that is how we're going to keep this going forward when you're gone or when, you know, the team grows to a size where you can't have one-on-ones with everyone or when the company gets sold and there's a totally different company culture. Your team, if you formalize this, is going to be, be able to retain their culture of learning. So the first one, and I also want to say that these are a little bit more challenging from like a management perspective because this is going to require being really like tuned in to the conversation happening on your team and to individual relationships on your team. So like if you are a person who's like, I don't really care about people, I just want to do DevOps, like I think you should try to do these things because I think they're really awesome, but I also want to acknowledge that they might be challenging for some folks who are not people managers or haven't done some kind of management training, et cetera. But I think you can do it a growth mindset. So the first thing you want to do is acknowledge informal mentorship relationships. Something that I have seen happen many times is I will have a senior engineer and a more junior engineer. And that senior engineer is a really nice person who's super patient and loves to teach. And the junior engineer will figure out very quickly who is the person who they should ask questions of because they're going to get a really useful answer. right? And they're going to feel safe with that person. So they have this sort of mini culture of learning out loud between the two of them. We want this culture to extend to the rest of the team, but we also want to acknowledge the hard work that our employees and friends and colleagues are doing. So what you want to do here is you want to go to the senior engineer, let's call them Erica, right? And you want to say, hey, Erica, I have seen you helping Gustavo so much. Gustavo's code has improved so much since you guys started spending time together. I see you guys, you know, with the little Slack huddle icon all the time. I just want to check in and make sure that you're finding that relationship fruitful and that you feel like you have time to continue to pursue that mentorship relationship. And if they say yes, then you as the leader needs to build time into their day. Right? So what that means is if you expect Erica to be working 40 hours a week, and you also expect Erica now, after this conversation, to be mentoring Gustavo five hours a week, that means that you have a responsibility to expect Erica to do 35 hours a week of IC work. This is, not an on this, this is not an on top of her job thing, right? Erica is doing her job by mentoring Gustavo. You want this kind of relationship to happen on your team. It's not fair to assume that people are just going to do this out of the goodness of their heart, right? Obviously, I mean, I work at a startup. I'm sure a lot of us work in environments where sometimes we're working more than 40 hours, and that's fine, and that's part of the deal. So, like, make this work for your team. But I just want to acknowledge that, like, if you see something awesome happening, don't just be like, wow, I'm so glad that awesome thing is happening outside of the formal structure of work, and I want that to continue, but I'm not going to do anything to make it continue. Like, acknowledge it and make it part of the formal structure of work and ensure that it continues, right? You can learn a new skill as a team. So if you see a lot of chatter about like, man, like we just don't know anything about Kubernetes, and our deployments keep failing, and we're just like, everyone is constantly asking questions about why this pod is in crash loop, and like no one knows the answer, you can say to your team like, hey, I am going to spend an hour a week studying Kubernetes. Would you all like to join me? And then put a meeting on the calendar and call that Kubernetes study session, and people will come. They really will. And that will, that will not only be a benefit to you because your team will suddenly know more things about Kubernetes, but that will also signal to folks that this is a team that values learning. This is a leader that wants us to spend our time on this, right? This is not a thing I have to hide. I think a lot of people like pretend they're not spending many hours of their day reading documentation. That's silly. Of course we're reading documentation. We're DevOps engineers. Like, <laughs> That's half of our job, right? So make that, acknowledge that, and, and create a formal space for that. Set aside time for study is kind of a similar thing. One thing I want to say is, like, we talked about Tina, who's the C++ expert. Something you also might do is say to Tina, if you see a lot of people asking her questions about C++ and you think it's, like, you know, fragmenting her day and getting her distracted, you might encourage her to do, like, a C++ office hours, right? Something that will... Give, not just have the benefit of like making her not be inundated with requests constantly, but also to formalize that and signal to the team that not only do we love it when you ask Tina about C++, but we love it so much that we ask Tina to carve some time out of her week, her very precious time, in order to continue to teach you all and to teach me and to have a collaborative learning relationship. And then also talk about your own professional development. I am not a certified Kubernetes administrator. 
I have been unsuccessfully studying for that exam for like four years. The book has been sitting on my desk for four years. I'm sure I could pass it. I just haven't got around to it. I'm very busy. But you can bet that I take every chance I can get to tell my employees that I am going to take three hours this afternoon to study for the Certified Kubernetes Administrator exam. And they all go, what? You're not a CKA? It's like, nope. <laughs> I didn't have time either. Right? But, I, but you want to say out loud, this is what I'm doing. I don't know everything. I am taking time out of my day. A lot of times people perceive their, their very senior ICs and people managers or like combination IC people managers as like their time being more valuable than mine. Like a lot of people will be like, oh, I don't want to ask them that question because like they're so busy and their time is so valuable and I'm a lowly junior engineer. And that's silly. And like, yes, your time is more valuable from like an hours to dollars ratio, right, for what the company's paying you. But it, you want to signal to them, like, I also take time out of my day and out of my life in order to study this stuff. I also value this in my own life. It's not just, you know, it's not a do as I say, not as I do situation. So I hope that everyone can sort of understand why this is important and why this is a good thing. But I do just want to take the last few minutes here to talk through some really concrete benefits to investing in this culture, especially because some of the things I'm suggesting will slow down a little bit of velocity, and that can feel like a really big sacrifice sometimes. Um, benefits to our engineering and our systems, we will have improved documentation, I promise. If you start being really thoughtful about encouraging this and encouraging public troubleshooting and asking people to learn out loud and talk to each other, you don't have to do it in Slack. I mean, Slack is sort of self-documenting in some ways, but, but I promise people will read more documentation. People will write more documentation. It will just happen. It's just a domino effect. You also have more coverage and redundancy, right? So if Erica gets hit by a bus, rest in peace, Erica, suddenly we have a whole bunch of people who maybe aren't C++ experts, but they know what she's taught them. But more importantly, they know how to learn C++. Right? There's this like, concept in dog training where sometimes people think they have a bad dog and really they just have a dog who doesn't know how to learn. And so the first like, two weeks of training that dog, all you're doing is training them that you have a treat and they're going to do something. It doesn't matter what they do. And when it clicks for them that they're learning a skill, they learn a lot faster. And I think that what's happening here when you have this team culture is you're not just making people learn more about C++, which is great, and they should if they're on a team that needs that, but it's that you're building a team of people who know how to learn and who know that they're learning, right? Who don't think of learning as secondary to their job. They think of it as part of their job. And then that way, when you encounter a problem that you've, no one on the team has seen before, then you're going to have a whole bunch of people instead of who are going to run around like chickens with their heads cut off not knowing what to do. They're all going to be like, I don't know. Let's learn it, right? There's also this, this idea that I really like. Um, Jane Jacobs is a like city planner, civil engineer person, and she wrote a really wonderful book called The Death and Life of Great American Cities, which is not DevOps related, but if you're a systems person like me, which I bet a lot of you are, I recommend it, it's really great. Um, she had this idea of eyes on the street, and basically her claim was, in order to make safe neighborhoods, we don't need a bunch of police walking around, we don't need a bunch of state surveillance, all we need is for businesses to have their windows facing the sidewalk. Because when we have eyes on the street, People feel safe, and when people feel safe, they don't do things that make other people feel unsafe. Um, and I think that learning out loud, this kind of thing, this is a sort of eyes on the street situation for our systems and our software. Right? If you have people asking questions publicly and feeling OK about asking questions publicly, then what you're going to have is they're going to ask a question that's going to raise a red flag for someone else who's an expert, and they're going to go, wait, 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 wait a second, where are you seeing that? Something's deeply broken. We need to fix it. And that's how we're going to create more safety in our systems and on our teams, is because we're going to be more open about talking about things that worry us, and so that we're going to see things come up sooner. And, this, and the last point is my favorite one. Um, I genuinely believe this. We've all talked about blameless postmortems. They're great. They're a really necessary part of any team and any kind of development process. But having this learning culture and doing this team learning exercise is like a blameless premortem. Right? It's like you get this opportunity to have people bring up a problem, bring up an incident before it's an incident, and you get people feeling comfortable talking about it and acknowledging that there's a problem, and then you get people fixing the problem before you ship the code. This is really powerful. I mean, I guess what we're talking about here is we're talking about like shifting postmortems left, 
right? Is we're trying to talk about this going, having this culture of going through an issue in public, in documentation, really, um, you know, methodically, but it's happening before the incident, and so we're gonna avoid incidents as they come up. And then finally, the benefits to the people and processes, of course, job satisfaction is huge, right? Um, I don't, I didn't grab actual statistics because I was in a little bit of a rush when I was making this final slide, <laughs> but I mean, I, I was reading about it and like something like 24% of software engineers in like a recent job satisfaction poll cited not having learning opportunities as a reason that they left a job. Right? People are really, people love learning. Learning feels so good. Right? We love learning new things, especially engineers. Right? And so having this, this learning culture is really gonna improve the job satisfaction on your team. Um, we also will create a higher trust team, which again, from a safety perspective is really important because We've all dropped a database in production. You know, we've all made some huge error that made our hearts sink and think, oh my gosh, I'm gonna get fired, right? We want people to bring that to our attention sooner rather than later, right? Like we need a culture where someone is gonna not spend, a, I mean, of course they're gonna spend some time worrying because that's a very scary moment and we should honor that feeling, but also we want them to spend a split second worrying and much more time solving the problem, right? And we want them to spend it solving the problem collaboratively. It's also great for training and advancement. Like, I, like we were talking about before, you know, having this team that knows how to learn is awesome. I think that one of the things that we see a lot in engineering is that sometimes the skills that make someone a great IC don't necessarily translate to being a great people manager, particularly in engineering. Um, and so when you have this, but it's really frustrating to not be able to promote from within. You know, we don't like being, having a new manager come in and manage us who we don't know, right? Being able to promote managers from your engineers is really, really valuable to, to creating a, a, a um, what's the word? I forgot the word, but to creating this culture and creating a continuity, right, in your team. Um, and so having people who are willing to learn new skills, even if they're soft skills and not technical skills, is really, really crucial to that. And then also, I believe that great leaders make new leaders, right? And so, and you, you, and what I mean is not only should you strive to make new leaders, but you are all the time. When you're a leader, everyone is looking at you and they're thinking, when I'm a leader, do I want to be like that person or not like that person? And so if you're building this culture and you're championing this, then the next generation of engineering leaders who you've helped shape are also going to be championing this culture. And as is evident, you can see that I really, really think this is important. So. That is my talk. Um, I just want to thank you all for being here and listening. I am here probably for the rest of the day, barring any home disasters that I may get texted about. But yeah, so I'm around. I would love to talk to you all. And um, I'll see you later.